Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Between Two Studs. I'm Alex Studd. And I'm Ron Studd. And Ron, tonight for episode 37, we got the man, Mr. Dan Pogoshelsky on. How are we doing, Dan? <laughs> when I'm here with you, Alex and Ron, always well. Oh, terrific. Thank and tonight, you. you're between us. <laughs> so, hey, so glad of you to, to be on the show. We're, we're excited. There's a lot to talk about. There's a lot going on in your life. Before we get into the official Ember Round, um, which is you know really just getting to, to, to know you at a surface level, as part of our show, as part of our tradition, Ron and I want to honor you, Dan, by having a shot of our uh, official uh, special sponsor. We are sponsored by Malort, the official spirit of Between Two Studs, a Chicago delicacy, as you know. So for you, Dan, thank you for being on the show, and to Malort, our sponsor, thank you. Cheers. 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 Butter every time. Oh, yeah. I love it. All right, Dan, you have entered the Ember Round. There's there's no way out. You are in until you make it all the way through the maze. Are you ready? Dun, 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 dun. Ba, da, da. <laughs> That's right. I don't know if we have the copyrights. Don't sing more than 15 seconds of those clips. Um, hey, so, yeah. so you don't want to get one of those takedown requests. All right. All right. So you're in, you're in first question. Uh, we always ask our guests because there's, yeah. there's always a connection. There's always got to be a connection. How do these guests get on our show? So the question I have to ask you is how do you know Ron or Alex? So you wandered in to a neighborhood that, uh, I didn't give myself this title, but, uh, I was christened as the unofficial mayor of Avondale. So mm. it was unfortunate for you that you wandered in to Avondale Bowl because then you had to talk to me. And uh, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. <laughs> I, I got to say, it was it was an absolute delight. Uh, and it, you, you, you hit me right where you needed to right away when all of a sudden I mentioned I had Western New York roots. And you were like, oh, I, I, I can pivot. I can have that conversation. So we did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Chicago and Buffalo, uh, Western New York have a lot of connections. So, for example, even the municipal charter that Chicago has based actually on Buffalo's. Uh, we also have where even the dialect of English, the Great Lakes uh, vowel shift, right? Uh, we say eggs. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh Myself as a ski, Daniel Pugajelski, I'm sure for you, uh, with knowledge of Buffalo, there's a lot of skis out there as well. And, there um, sure are. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so um, it's, it's my pleasure to help you guys reconnect this legacy between your end of the Great Lakes and ours. We, we, we have a shared treasure. Oh, absolutely. It. Absolutely. And, you know, we're going to get into that in, in more detail for sure as we get a little bit further on. <laughs> but it is it is interesting because we know each other. I mean, yes, you I walked into that bar, but it was through our mutual friend, Casey Smagalia, who was on the show Smagala last week. Yeah. So uh, it's it's kind of funny. Uh, we're, I got another to know boy you, from Casey. the Great Lakes who ended up here in go. Chicago. That's true. That's true. So, uh, yeah, obviously you have your ties to Chicago. We'll get into that more too. But tell us a little bit about yourself in more detail, Dan. I mean, what's what's your background? What's your areas of interest other than Chicago? Uh, sure. Um, I think that at the at the root of who I am is uh, two words that are from Hebrew, which is tikkun olam, to fix the world. Um, now, granted, to truly fix everything is something that's way outside the scope of what any person can do. But I do endeavor to try in my own way to try to improve things. I believe that in a certain sense, we're all co-responsible, which means that there's so much that's going on and, and you don't have a con control over it. But to the best of my ability, I try to be of service to make this world better than what I found it. And I think that 
that is at the foundation, at least partially, right, of, of who I am. I love that. That is a really beautiful answer, by the way. Like, <laughs> like I mean, there's so much that went into that. Just and, and really, that's that's a really awesome. That's just to keep an these awesome glasses way of sharp. It. You know, yeah, sh- for sure. Chicago Northwest Side Bungalow Belt uh, <laughs> philosopher. <laughs> I should I should have delivered it in a in a with more of a Chicago accent. Hey, uh, so uh, there's a guy named Socrates. <laughs> he was in Bill and Ted, I'm pretty sure, right? So- Socrates is so great. <laughs> <laughs> so so Dan, uh, I, I have to ask because because you know Ron yeah. and I just had a Chicago delicacy. We just had a shot of Malort. It's my understanding you're also having. A Chicago delicacy tonight, aren't you? That's right. Uh, you know, we share twenty uh, percent of the world's fresh water. Whether you're in Erie, Pennsylvania, whether you're in uh, the part of Michigan where Mr. Smagala comes from, or you're in Chicago, uh, that is the Great Lakes. Twenty percent of the world's fresh water right here in our region. And I just had some Chicago tap water, uh, mm. <laughs> very, very applicable. Uh, I can't say that it's just a coincidence. It was also a statement, <laughs> but, uh, it, it, in all seriousness, um, it's the, it's one of the most important things that, uh, in our neck of the woods, I think people don't pay enough attention to, I, you know, water is, life but water is also death um i think that's one of the things that's just important for us to to remember it's this magical property one of the four elements and uh, i'm sure we're going to get into the weeds about about that especially if i'm around where uh, northwest side philosopher is gonna wax on about it especially with some historical context here (laughs) (laughs) very cool and for me Tonight, I'm having water also from a <laughs> lake, um, not maybe as well-known or great, but I'm having it from the fabulous uh, Lake Lanier of Georgia, which feeds the Chattahoochee. So, cheers. Cheers, and Alex, cheers indeed. What are you drinking? You know, I, uh, I do have water by my side, but I am also working on uh, some Buffalo Trace. So, you oh, know, nice. I know Buffalo <laughs> Trace is not made on the Great Lakes, but, you know, Buffalo, certainly yeah. an important city there you go. on the Great Lakes. So, well, there you go. And I, th- here's, and I think for whiskey. Here's a question. Sure. S- sorry to cut you off. All, of course, typical Dan Pogo. No, but um, so my understanding, people always think Buffalo comes from that magnificent animal, Ron, that you have behind you, right? The... This, um, on the one hand, it's it's not a carnivore, right? But at the same time, a fearsome animal, if you were to encounter it face-to-face, a tank that just might lunge at you. But that, my understanding, is not where the name buffalo comes from. Instead, it's from French, <laughs> beau flu. Yes, you are spot on. Beautiful. Beautiful. Spot on. The river that, that, that empties out into the Erie, or, uh, sorry, that empties out, it ended up becoming part of the Erie Canal. There's a river and um, they, they, the French settled it first, and mm-hmm. they called it Beautiful River, Buffalo. And yeah. the English showed up, and they were like, I don't know what they're saying. It sounds like buffalo. And there you know. How that's, do you like the fact that another, another city that lies along the uh, U.S.-Canadian border has a, a similar heritage? Detroit. Which, Detroit. The Straits. Oh. <laughs> didn't know that. Detroit. I didn't know that. That's yeah. yeah. why. And, and and you certainly know this. Chicago, isn't that named after like a smelly like onion or something? Yeah, so um things that are unpleasant oftentimes have multiple meanings and uh it is that's either that Chicago is a stinky place or that it is an onion or some people also say a ramp. Have you guys ever had ramps? They're really, really popular now. Uh, they're very hard, hard to grow. Um, yeah. So, so R A M P ramp. Yes. Ramp. Yeah. Popular in Appalachia. <laughs> it's a, it's a, a relative of the onion. You guys should Google it right now. 
<laughs> you know, Ron, our ancestors who lived in Appalachia for generations are they're they're rolling in their graves right now that we don't know what a ramp is. Seriously. <laughs> they're like, What? You haven't had a ramp? <sighs> I thought you were going to go somewhere with, like, Chicago's got many layers, like an onion, or like Shrek, right? <laughs> you could right, say, bad. That sounds like a politician's answer. It's an onion. I didn't, I didn't deliver it, just for the record. Just want, you did. Just want that strike noted. it from the record. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Dan. So one of the questions we ask all of our guests yeah. is to take a piece of art that speaks to you. And it could be any piece of art. It could be any different genre or medium of art either. So it could be song, could be a movie, could be experience, you name it. And ideally, we're looking for something that really relates to you or defines you or just really speaks to you in a very pronounced way. So what would that piece of art be for you, sir? I will go with I, I was thinking about it. I'm glad that you went on for a little bit because I had to I had to I had to really think about that. <laughs> but given the fact that we're here with connections between the state of New York and Chicago, I'm gonna throw at you Thomas Dija, or in Polish we say Dia, Thomas Dija's book, The Third Coast. Uh, catalogs Chicago, right? We live in a bi coastal nation now, so I think that's even in the context of it where he catalogs Chicago being the cultural capital of the United States uh, from the 1920s up until the moment when the first uh, airplane went off from New York City to Los Angeles without having to stop at Chicago's O'Hare Airport. Um, people, artists, the Institute of Design, Vivian Meyer, uh, Maholi Naj, uh, so many innovations, even corporations uh, like McDonald's, uh, franchising, Playboy, it all started in Chicago, right? And that's – and the way that he writes, it's, there's, a, there's a poetry in his prose. Mm -hmm. it does, it's not a happy ending though. It, it ends where Chicago was the cultural capital, right? was mm -hmm. that's past tense that's not a happy ending um i guess in in this context my hope is that the midwest which have really suffered you know, the rust belt um mm -hmm. in my life the less people are interested in something the more i'm interested in it i'm part of something called forgotten chicago we try to summarize our interests from industry, ethnic perspectives, and the built environment to be champions of the overlooked. Uh, more like touring the Calumet River as opposed to uh, the Loop. <laughs> uh, I like that. In that context, we are looking at an area which has been really not given its due. People have been talking about flyover country, right? Chicago has mm -hmm. fared well than other areas of the Midwest and the Great Lakes regions, but it's precisely water. We've heard it repeated over and over again. Water is the resource over which people will be fighting over in the 21st century, whereas it was over oil in the 20th century. And there's promise. Um, we do see where that has borne fruit. Lagunitas, right? Moving production here because you need water <laughs> if you want to have if beer. You want beer. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it was my pitch. So a few nights ago, I'd say one of the easiest places that I went to try to gather petitions was at uh, the, the brew fest that they had in Lincoln Square a few nights ago where I would just start and say, I'm a dedicated environmentalist. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm in. It's like, whoa, wait. No, Do you want to keep drinking beer? Whole pitch, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, you know, part of it might have been, the, hey, they had a couple beers, so they were happy. Like, sure, why not, right? Um, but in all seriousness, uh, so much of everything um, connects to water. It, it's the, the connection, by the way, in our region, goes back to water too. The birth of Chicago goes back to water. Um, go back to you know antiquity. The 
Roman Empire was a necklace around the Mediterranean Sea. The Great Lakes brought people together. That's why it might seem so odd. Buffalo? Chicago? What's the connection? The connection was foretold by uh, Marquette and Joliet as in the service of New France. Uh, uh, the king of France and exploring New France had gone down to Arkansas and on their way back from indigenous folks, they had heard that there was a, a shortcut that they wouldn't have to go all the way up north to Wisconsin uh, to go back in their canoe as they were traveling. But instead that there was a strange feature, a potage, same it's where portable comes from when you hold something, mm-hmm. that the uh, subcontinental divide was so low that in the spring and in the fall, the two water systems with the Chicago River, which would empty out into the into Lake Michigan, then uh, exit out the St. Lawrence um, River out into Newfoundland. And then you have where just a, a few feet away, waters would go down to the Plains River, which feeds into the Illinois River, which goes in the Mississippi, and meets the Gulf of Mexico in the vicinity of New Orleans, right? And these areas, which were so low-lying, would become a swamp, and sometimes you wouldn't even get out of your canoe. R- wrote in their notes, if someone were to create a canal here, they would rule the North American continent, right? That's the beginnings of Chicago. Or shadow. Oh, yeah. Oh, 100%. <laughs> and the the building of the Erie Canal as well as the INM Canal, which, by the way, there was a state of Illinois bank. The only investment it made was the beginning of the INM Canal. That <laughs> was, was the beginning of that, which, by the way, took forever. It wasn't completed until 1848. The INM stands for the Illinois-Michigan Canal. Mm-hmm. Completely reoriented and changed the way that commerce flowed in the United States from being this really circuitous path where grains would come down the waterways, the the different river systems on barges, where they would be the wood would be disassembled in New Orleans. Then it would have to go through onto ocean going ships through the Gulf of Mexico. Had to worry about pirates. <laughs> Piracy was a thing um, around Florida, and then go to where it would be sold um, in the New York, New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, Mid Atlantic area. Right, that was all <laughs> resolved once the, the Erie Canal went in. Well, the Erie Canal plus the I N M Canal, those those yeah. two canals literally reoriented, um, and obviously you know made that economy more efficient. Uh, it's interesting to remember the state of Illinois was much of it was settled um, from the south. Even Abraham Lincoln came, was born in Kentucky. Um, this area where we're at, this is different. We are Yankees. You hear that in our speech. You hear that in the way that we talk and the connections to upstate New York uh, in the northern part of the state span from places like Woodstock, Illinois, right, connected to Woodstock in New York, um, mm-hmm. even even the, the uh, Mormon faith, right? So the Mormon faith moved from upstate New York and then Nauvoo, which is Elmira, New York. Yep. 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 Uh, Right here. And of course it's on the, the other part of our state, but nonetheless, once again, along the waterway here in, in Northern Illinois. And so water allowed us to connect as people. It were, these were the original super highways. Uh, (laughs) How ironic that in the 1830s and 1840s, when, uh, Lincoln and Douglas were campaigning through the state um, and many other elected officials. And they were talking about trying to create an ambitious infrastructure project of wooden Water. plank roads. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so, that, so, that, so that we wouldn't be all stuck in mud. And so the alternative to building that uh, prior, to, uh, prior to railways was, in fact, these – Wooden plank roads. I mean, uh, if you've ever been down Irving Park Road, uh, west of Costner Avenue, that used to be a plank road that went all the way to Elgin. And it was actually water from the Des River. There was a steam, there was a mill, wood mill, sawmill that was 
built there, and that created the planks for it in the, uh, I think it was like 1859, if I remember correctly. And so the, the legacy of that is now the State Route uh, 19, uh, which you can, which does in fact go all the way out to Elgin, and uh, you can go to the uh, go to past uh, the two rivers along it, uh, all the way to the lake. So, yeah, <laughs> I did not know that. But you know, I I think what you're saying is 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 so fundamentally important for for anyone listening because mm-hmm. I I think so oftentimes people really do think about the the coasts. You'd mentioned it earlier, the flyover states, and yeah. you know I've always taken that really personally because when you think about Chicago and Buffalo, these two cities that you've just mentioned, all of the grains, all of the meat, everything that that all of that fertile land that everything was grown and farmed, I, it wasn't just going to magically get to the coast. It's not like there was an uh, there's a there's a natural uh, in farming environment to support nine million people in New York City. Right, like it has to come from somewhere, and and so I think there's so much history involved, and I think it's cool that you. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like you 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 want to you want to take that forgotten part of America and bring it back. Am I right in saying that, or at least give it its day in court to say this was important, and quite frankly, it will be important in the future too. Uh, I a hundred percent. I think that the key in that. In fact, it's water. We both, people have called it the blue economy. There's a wonderful history that I think is also very important to, to highlight. Um, I know we had a, the opportunity to talk about manufacturing, right? Lar- Larkin products. Uh, Larkin soap in, in Buffalo. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's a connection there to Chicago. Uh, I, I do know, yeah, you guys have Larkinsville out in, in Buffalo. But um, this brings promise. Uh, and... There's an old adage, walking over dollars to pick up pennies. Now, I think that we should have clean water because it's the right thing to do. But at the same time, I think there's a good argument to be made that given what a precious resource this is, if you if you don't share my views on that, you should look at it also from an economic perspective. And I think that's incredibly important because – this is a way forward for us to really develop our region in a way that will be beneficial for everyone. Well said, Dan. Well, listen, oh, I, I think I think uh, th- there was one more question, but I think yeah. you just passed the amber round. As far as I'm concerned, you you made your way. Let's just say this: you sailed through. Did I? You sailed through. He absolutely did. Well, there we go. That was for you, Dan. Congratulations so, on making it through the Ember round. <laughs> so, listen, I and I mean this. I could listen to you talk all day about your love of history. And, in fact, that's kind of how we, we first met. I mean, we were sitting at a bar for Casey's birthday, and I ended up just listening yeah. to you talk about this awesome connection that most people – I hate to say it. Not only do they not know it, not not only do they not understand it, um, but they just don't seem to care, um, which is really which is really the sad part. But so I, I want to kind of dig on that a little bit, right? Because sure. there's the content that you understand and appreciate. Can you talk about where that where where you credit that love. I mean, you don't just wake up one day with that knowledge. I have a passion for people to not forget things that otherwise will be forgotten. Um, you know, like the Nintendo screen had that, had that, all that is not saved will be lost, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess that's part of it is in telling stories, in trying to pass this on, because we conceive and understand things in terms of stories. If I were to throw just facts at you, uh, it'd be unintelligible gobbledygook, you know. It's the difference between, you know, if you remember the Matrix films, right? The the last one installment just came out, right? Most of us just see little digits, but if you're able to connect it to a story, all of a sudden, it is sha- assumes shapes that are intelligible and you could understand. Uh, I think that's fundamental for for how we perceive things, and so being able to to share those. Um, 
interesting facts and hooks in a way that is interesting, I think is, is fundamental to, to making sure that we, we keep that around. Um, I imagine that there's also a, a bit of a genetic proclivity because I thought this was always really interesting from my mother's side of the family. I have where had professors, the Medelsky family. So uh, there was a, a lot, uh, an, indus, uh, an illustrious uh, past uh, number of different members. So among them, you had where my great grandfather, he unfortunately uh, perished in Auschwitz. He was uh, a, a military, he was involved in Poland's military prior to World War II. His mm. three sons, among them my grandfather, his twin brother, and his other brother, they were among the earliest prisoners there and survived. Um, no. You had where another relative, oh, and then one of their other brothers, he had escaped Poland and did not get captured by the Nazis. And then he ended up um, becoming a professor of history in Kalamazoo, uh, Professor Isidore Medelsky, right? Um, <clears throat> you have where another one was a double agent and a uh, general in the Polish military. He's buried in Washington, D.C. because when he defected, uh, when the, when the uh, Soviet occupied regime in Poland at the time was like, oh, you should come home. We want to talk to you. He's like, oh, I don't know about that. And so he got a home in Chevy Chase, Maryland, till the till till his wife passed away, uh, courtesy of the U.S. government and uh, an obit in the New York Times. And wow. uh, my understanding is that folks, and this is for my mom's side of the family, and uh, m- my mom doesn't have a passion for. Uh, history or anything like that. She's my my father actually knows more about our family history from my mom's side than my dad does. Uh, the, my mom, my dad knows more than my <laughs> my family history. Sorry, uh, than my than my mom does. Uh, mm-hmm. However, she's a voracious reader. Uh, granted, it's like more Brad Thor, and she'll be like reading like five or six of these you know fiction books, but she reads, and uh, I certainly love reading. I actually, um, oh, and I should have mentioned this. So uh, in Michigan, uh, it's actually my uncle, my great uncle Isidore's son, the one that was a professor in Kalamazoo. One of his sons was the prosecutor for Jack Kevorkian. And I actually remember hanging out. Yeah, so no I remember, way. Yeah. So I remember hanging out with, uh, with uh, uh, my college sweetheart, uh, him and his wife. And they were talking about like, oh yeah, she was, they were like, the reading is just insane, right? Like she was like, and she said this half joking, but half serious, like it's a sickness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know? Yeah. And she, she, she's, a, she's a sweet old lady, but I remember she, her talking about like, what a voracious reader, like always reading. And uh, I certainly have the same passion. I'm, I'm proud to say I'm the co-author of, of, for history books, granted they're picture books, so I can't really compare with uh, <laughs> my with my uh, with my hey, great uncle. That's four there. more books than I have. Uh, I assure <laughs> this you, guy too. And they, uh, my book's could have been all pictures, uh, and they still haven't been published. So that's well, actually really cool. Say, but, but go ahead, Ron. I was going to say too is is you were kind of giving your wonderful explanation about your choice of art, and and even just telling us a little bit more about you there. I love the way that you weaved in language, like you had some French within there, right? You were also uh, weaving Wait, in... don't forget he was talking about the Roman Empire in there as well. Right. Well, you got all the history woven into that story. You've got He brought philosophy. up World War II. Where, where didn't we check the box yet? Right. If, if, for, those, for those at home playing bingo uh, categories, <laughs> we're, we're, it's a full card. And not only that, but you also gave it with quite a really great narrative with gravitas. Like, there's a certain element of uh, Jacques Cousteau, like, in the way that you described it. It was like, well, upon the river, there was Chicago. (laughs) And upon Chicago, there was the Buffalo. Like, it was just beautiful. I'm impressed. So I'm not surprised that you've written books. That's, That's really amazing, though. 
Well, thank but, you. But I, I, I think, Dan, you know, one of the things that, that, that I agree with, because I also love history, I can't claim to know as much as you, but I love history and it, it helps when all of a sudden you're, you're able to tie it back to your own lineage, right? Like you see it in your own and you go, why did my ancestors move from this part of the country or this part of the world to this part of the world? Um, and it's, it's neat when you can kind of, as we've, we've already said tonight, peel back the onion and kind of oh, yeah. see the story of how that kind of comes about. I mean, there's a little fun, I don't even know if Ron knows this, but I, I did about two years ago, I did this really extensive genealogy background on, on our family and through my, my mother's side, Ron and I are our fourth great uncle. His name is Jesse Hawley. And Jesse Hawley was actually um, in, in debtor's prison. And while he was in debtor's prison, he had this whole idea. He was, he was a merchant. He had this whole idea of, of connecting Buffalo to the Hudson. And he actually became friendly with DeWitt Clinton, who was – the, the, the governor of New York when he got out of prison. That's and what he actually he convinced DeWitt, or DeWitt Clinton to put in the Erie Canal, which at the time they called it DeWitt's Ditch because they thought it was an abysmal failure. But it ended up connecting the Midwest to, you know, and, and making New York the, the superpower that it is. And so that's like Ron and I, we have a direct ancestor who helped convince the governor of New York to put that in. Yeah, that's cool. Hundred percent. You know, on the blue line, you'll have where there's a, a Clinton Street, and people think, "Oh, that's after Bill Clinton because he was the president." It's like, no, that's actually after Dewitt Clinton, and it goes to show you the legacy that this waterway has. Which, by the way, uh, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, the reversal of Chicago River, also very, very oh. involved with that. So that's something that's important. But before we get into that. Uh, it's amazing because um, there's two ways that I would say COVID really um, impacted my life. It's like you knew yeah. the list of questions. <laughs> <laughs> you're even answering it after we've done the Ember Round. So you're like getting bonus points on this. <laughs> um, I have ESPN. <laughs> some, some folks, they, they might have not heard the N and they're like, oh, okay. No. He's got ESP. No. ESPN. Actually, I don't like sports, so I don't watch ESPN. Or I try, I try not to watch ESPN. Um, but um, in, all, in all seriousness, one of them was that uh, I live not that far away from the Plains River, and I got to see this what I would call the sweep and swell of the seasons. You normally walk through the woods, and you're like, oh, trees, plants, pleasant smells. Maybe not so pleasant smells sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, nature. But walking on a regular basis, you know, you're secluded, you're like, wanted to be safe, be conscientious, especially in the early part of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Would go walk down the Desplaines River. And it was so breathtaking to see how the plants would come up, bloom, seed, and then die. And this rotating symphony of totally different plant life, just waiting to take the stage, right? Normally you're just like, oh, it's like you see a photo, it's like, oh, trees, flowers. But once you see it in the context of how they come in, they give life, and then they exit the stage. And that was just oh, go. one of the I most think amazing stay. <laughs> um, no, but 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 seriously, like uh, it was it, it was uh, astonishing, and uh, for sure that that was the the other thing was actually genealogy. Um, took uh, taking some of these techniques that we uh, utilized in research, whether it was for tours that we gave or uh, research in talking about neighborhoods, applied them. And uh, for example, uh, finding a connection to, uh, through four sentences in Latin that was cited in a book from around the turn of the 19th and 20th century 
that traced my family and their village back to 1492, uh, where I guess they were trespassing. They, there was four sentences which talked about how they paid a bond for trespassing on their neighbor's property. And it's said that they were, uh, they, they called upon during this uh, lawsuit, upon what was called the Prussian privilege. And what that meant is that one of the first genocides, um, well, I guess uh, first genocides that we know of in, in, in that part of the world was the old Prussians, right? When you hear the word Prussian, you think German. And no, these, the old Prussians were a people who spoke a Baltic language. Those are the most archaic Indo-European languages, like Lithuanian, it's relative, is the most archaic Indo-European language that we know that's alive. Mm-hmm. When the Jesuits first came there to try to convert them to Christianity in the 15th century, they thought they spoke weird Latin. That's how archaic mm. um, it is. And so the old Prussian, which, was, which is even more archaic, um, the Teutonic Knights, who were crusading knights, came there after having been kicked out of the Holy Land and decided to set up shop there um, on in their homeland. And the after two uprisings, the net result was that one-third of the old Prussians were killed off, one-third ended up as refugees, and one-third ended up staying there in that region, uh, which is called Prussia today, Half of it is in the Kaliningrad Oblast of Russia, and half of it's in Poland. That uh, that area, uh, uh, <clears throat> that area, that ethnos no longer exists. But the ones that were refugees, a good chunk of them ended up in Poland or Lithuania and, and adjacent lands. And it turns out that my ancestors were connected to this long gone people, which is just like. Wow, it was it was amazing, and uh, s- reading some of these uh, some of these histories was just like, and, and being able to to get to something that was so deep. Of course, some of it in legend, which was so reminiscent for those of people who are fans of Games of Thrones, literally scenes like Game of Thrones. Now, granted, yeah. that's only for the part of my ancestry that was from nobility. Those that were from you know peasant stock, it's. Hey, you know, before the nineteenth century, before the twentieth century, uh, I know they lived, the they worked, they died. That's it, right? Yeah, that's yeah. that's it. But yeah. but things like that was just you know completely fascinating. It is remarkable, and I think it really helps connect dots and, and helps people say this isn't just a point in history. This is our history. Like we're all part of it, right? Yeah. So hey, listen, I, I know we could keep having this conversation, but we're going to have to go to break. But when we come back. Pogo, I, I want to get into uh, a little bit about what makes you tick outside of your your immense knowledge, right? I want to talk about uh, your your political uh, interests, your political ambitions, and I, I, I really want to talk about maybe uh, some Polish food as well. So we'll be right back. We'll be right back. Sounds like a plan. Hey everyone, Ron here, and I want to take a quick moment to thank you for being a listener. But one thing I'd ask, if you're able to do so, we'd greatly appreciate it if you could give us a review of our podcast, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or join our Discord server. We'd greatly appreciate it. And we'll be posting a link to our Discord server in today's episode. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Between Two Studs. I'm, we're hanging out with, with Dan Pogo. And for those who are watching the video, you might notice how we all look different. Clothing. Ron got a haircut. Dan's in a car. Um, this it was a traumatic might, experience. This first part, you know, I don't have a break. You, right? Hunted me down. I was trying to get going, and yet the powers of the two studs just freaking found me, and here I am. <laughs> so yeah. what? So what ended up Ron. happening, actually, uh, so that we can give everyone clarity. Uh, in the middle of our actual recording, we were planning on completing the second part. And all of a sudden we cut to our break and that's what we normally do. We give every one of our guests a few minutes to kind of just, you know, grab a quick drink of water or whatever they need to do. And then we come back during that time. uh, We actually were receiving the news. It was late breaking news about the invasion of Russia into the Ukraine. Given the uncertainty of the situation, what all was going on, what that meant for all of us, we decided that it was probably in the best interest for everyone that we, take a moment and kind of let things 
kind of uh, really kind of become a little bit clearer. And that would also allow us an opportunity to come back with, uh, you know, a fresh perspective. Cause I think one of the biggest things that that did for all of us is it very quickly changed our sentiment. We went in being very happy and all of a sudden after the news, it was just like, what is this going to mean? What are the next steps and how is this going to impact everyone in the world today? So that's part of the reason why we decided to have that break and we're happy to be back and we're happy to have uh, Dan back with us. The situation currently is still going on, unfortunately in the Ukraine. And I think um, Alex and I, and I'm sure Dan um, also offer up our sincere support for all the people of Ukraine. And we hope that there can come a solution to end what's going on there uh, as quickly as possible. Couldn't have said it any better, Ron. Our, our thoughts are obviously with the Ukrainian people, but we, sleep. we've like I yeah. the, the whole night, especially for us Polish folks. Um, the it's not just some abstraction. We if you're Polish, like from Poland, like as mm-hmm. my parents are, then you grew up with stories about, for example, my grandfather. Uh, from let's start like this, my mother's father was in Auschwitz among the earliest prisoners in Auschwitz. His, he had to watch his own father get murdered. He was able to survive because one of his brothers was also a prisoner there, uh, ended up taking care of rabbits. And so they stole rabbit food. Um, you have where my mother's mother, on the other hand, she actually was born in what is today Ukraine. And they had to flee from the Soviets who were going to deport her to Siberia where she would probably die or be worked with the idea that at some point you will, you will die. Right. That was the plan. And the thing that stopped that was that the Nazi Germans invaded the Soviet union. And so at that point they're like, Oh, well let's not kill you. Let's use you as cannon fodder. Um, But I could go on and on. And so for people that come from, my part of Europe, it's not an abstraction. These are all people that you grew up with and you hear stories about the trauma that they lived through. And so that comes to mind immediately. Um, there, This past weekend, there was a, a whole slew of different events that the Polish community did on behalf of, of Ukraine. And uh, it's still ongoing uh, because of the fact that our peoples are interrelated, Polish and Ukrainian. It's like the difference between Italian and Spanish. So the, very easy to understand the two. They're, a thousand years ago, is the same language. Uh, well, and, and Pogo is, is interesting because obviously it's been a couple of weeks since we recorded part mm-hmm. one. And I remember seeing you on, on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And it was an Instagram live. And I, I don't know if you were in the yeah. Ukrainian village I was but in. You were speaking. Yes. <laughs> you were speaking. I, all of a sudden, I was like, "Are you speaking Ukrainian?" I, um, there was a Ukrainian artist. Uh, his name is Max Komarov. So I was there with Polish TV, and uh, we were there um, because a um, he created with Project Logan. So it's interesting because the folks that helped create hip hop in Chicago, they're older now, right? But they still love hip hop. They still love graffiti. Uh, I'm friends with them. Uh, one of them, his name is ABC Flash. Him and B-Boy B, they have something called Project Logan. So Logan Square on a cement yard. Uh, they have an internationally curate, well, cur- they curate featuring some international artists, a revolving art installation on which you have street artists who come from all over the world. And in this case, because of the situation, they decided that they were going to have a mural with Ukraine and to have people be able to participate in it, you were able to put your handprint on there. And so um, we talked about it. We had people come out and we ourselves got to, in this very uh, physical fashion, right, participate in that. And so uh, I did speak a little bit to the artist in, in Ukraine. He spoke fluent Polish, though, too. So we spoke that as well. Wow. Well, you know, obviously a uh, horrible situation going on there, but I, I do want to talk about your Polish roots because mm-hmm. it's obviously such a huge part of, of who you are and your identity. 
Pogorshelsky. Did I pronounce that correctly? You did. You did. I mean, uh, all right. That that the the, the, the that Polishness just swelled in you like a punch key. And uh, <laughs> here, you know what? Speaking, well, so- of, speaking of, this is something that um, I always felt. Uh, we all have strange ambitions in the sense of like we all have things that we we really want to have an impact on, and some of these could be a little bit more. Um, curious i guess i would i would say so um uh so for example japan is known as the the land of the cherry blossom right and uh and godzilla <laughs> well, and yeah, the rising sun i've heard that too that's true yeah uh which goes back to the flag and um maybe this is my own uh dabbling in in poetry and the love of the written word and the spoken word uh but we are all familiar with Shakespeare, right? Uh, what was the famous uh, quote with a rose? Uh, no other a uh, rose? rose by any other by any other name would smell just as That's sweet. Right. So you're familiar right. with the smell of a rose, right? And how it activates yes. you. The sight of a rose, the the feel of a rose, right? Um, like when you touch it. Um. In Poland, that love of roses has an additional facet. Polish people eat roses. Like, you can have rose-flavored ponchki. Uh, no way. Yeah, rose hips. Yeah, it's it, it's honestly it's my favorite. And it's actually very reminiscent of raspberries, and they're actually related. Raspberries are rosacea. So raspberries are related to, to roses. So that, that the similarities in smell... And taste are not coincidental. And uh, because of the, um, on the one hand, one could argue that Poland has some beautiful elements of its history, uh, also some painful elements. So, for example, like when you're talking about World War II, here you have a country which in 1939 had about 38 million people and in 1945 had 12 million less. If I remember correctly, the numbers, right? I believe it was around 12 million, right? Of which 6 million were murdered, at least, mm. by the Germans. There's, And don't forget the Soviets. I mean, there was, um, and refugees. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's um, like a rose, right? It can have beautiful, but also bittersweet and painful parts. And so I always thought that Poland is the land of the rose. Is that mm. actually what it's known for? Did you come up with that? I guess. The land of the rose. I guess. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of many, many little things that, you know, when I, I guess, uh, ponder things from time to time. <laughs> I mean, it the colors across. match, so. That's true. I think you should talk to the Ministry of Tourism there, <laughs> right? No, actually, so I always thought, like, to write a little essay. I've, I do these things from time to time, um, mm-hmm. uh, essays or, or poetry and stuff like that. I actually have this awesome I guess my, it's my own little love song to Chicago. Uh, you know, these are typically not things that one should talk about because of the fact it's, it opens you up to easily der- <laughs> easy derision. But um, yeah, it's uh, Chicago is an amazing place, and at the same time, it can be a difficult place to love as well. You know, it reminds me of James Baldwin. So- oh God. No, no, I was just going to say, you know, this is this is really interesting, um, Ogo, and I think what, what I found interesting when I first moved to Chicago is I immediately recognized the, the Polish influence. <laughs> and you, you tell me if I'm wrong. I, isn't Chicago, outside of Poland, the largest Polish community um, uh, in, the, in the world? Sure. It's, it's, it's up yeah, there. I, yeah, so I'm sure that when, you know, there have been Poles that have been coming to Chicago before there was even a city of Chicago itself, right? Uh, so even before it had, right. uh, before it had its municipal charter, there were Polsky folk here. And so I'm sure that at the beginning of the 20th century or the late 19th century, it was the largest Polish city outside of Warsaw. However, you have lots of large Polish cities today in Poland. So I think that truth is true in a symbolic fashion. It is certainly the North American capital of Poland and Polish culture. And you'll find uh, a number of folks who can totally not only get by only speaking in Polish. My mom, who uh, 
She got a master's degree in English and was on her way to getting a doctorate. Tells me that her English has gotten worse since she moved to Chicago 40 years ago. That's that's amazing. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about that for a moment, though. Uh, more so the, the, the Polish culture in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And, and let's talk about food, because I think most Americans that don't have Polish roots, mm-hmm. when they think of Polish food, they go, oh, pierogies, right? And, There's and a lot of love it's for a lot more complex Chicago, than that, right? Um, you know, yeah, I'm not, listen, I'm not knocking pierogies. I'm yeah. just, for the listener, Yeah, can you maybe give, give us, us a little bit more, more about more Polish than, food? More than foods? So I think a good yeah. way to begin is to think about uh, the environment. You think of the inf- cultural influences. You also think of the climate, right? And so uh, Poland, and I would compare it to Wisconsin, is very similar to Wisconsin. Plenty of, of, of small freshwater lakes, lots of woods rolling hills, but very flat with the exception of the very southern part of the country. So, for example, in terms of Poland and its culinary uh, its, its culinary traditions, you have where in the highlands, it's the Polish Balkans, I would call it, because you had uh, hundreds of years ago people that partly at least were refugees from the Ottoman Empire. You had people that were in the uh were from romania uh so sorry there's a person that's literally trying to get my attention from outside of the car here so not Hmm. very auspicious here um you had where these people for example their culinary traditions were from the balkans and so for example they took they call it brinza which is a word from romanian and it's like feta cheese. It's made from sheep's cheese. And this cheese is spreadable and they cut it with cream and and butter. So it's like a spreadable feta, right? They have something called moskola, mm. which is like a Polish flatbread, which is a flatbread, but it's made with potato flour instead. Right? Mm. And so uh, also Bigos is very well known. Uh, I actually had thought um, there's a uh, the, one of the three basilicas in Chicago, St. Hyacinth Basilica, is Polish. And that basilica, uh, very connected to um, our community, I always thought that we could do a Bigos Fest as a fundraiser. You know, there's already a pierogi fest. You, you know, Whiting, Indiana's got it. They, they are very big on that, right? Um, I thought, oh, this would be some, something interesting. People translate it, and it's like a hunter's stew. Um, it's a, a very well-known uh, food in Poland and uh, would definitely, I think, lend itself to a good fundraiser for that parish, for that community of faith. Hmm. Well, I've been saying, Dan, one of the first things I said to you once I got to know you, yeah. I said, listen, Buffalo, we, we got Dingus Day, yeah. and it's, it's the Dingus Day capital yeah. of the world, they well, say. Uh, yeah. Because it is more, from what I understand, Dingus Day itself is more of a Polish American holiday than a Polish well, holiday. I could be, I could be wrong. The roots obviously go to Poland. Yeah. Well, I guess this is this is a perfect segue for me, uh, because what makes Dingus Day and what connects Buffalo and Chicago is water. And so here, what better way for me to link up these uh, this subject? Because. Uh, whether it was coming from across the sea, right? Coming from across the ocean, right? The Atlantic Ocean from Poland to North America and also from New York, whether it was from New York City through Ellis Island coming up to Buffalo and then also coming to Chicago, both these cities on the Great Lakes, it was through water. And Dingus, first of all, Dingus Day, what is Dingus Day? Uh, It's an old pre-Christian holiday that... Uh, became part of Polish tradition where after Easter uh, in villages, people would tease each other, show affection for each other by splashing them with water the Monday after Easter. And uh, Buffalo, New York, right? Which some argue is uh, per capita, even more Polish. It's a smaller city, right? Um, and it, it is. So it is per capita more 
more Polish roots, but it's a much smaller yeah. city. So in terms of quantity, there's way more Polish people in Chicago. Apples and oranges, right? Yeah, yeah. but if you think about, uh, you know, we're, we're Bills fans, so <laughs> I, I don't necessarily like Gronkowski, but Gronkowski's from yes. Buffalo, right? Yes. So, um, yeah. So, but it's actually water that also connects us culturally. The city of Chicago's municipal charter is based on that of Buffalo. Uh, so uh, chickens lay what? Chickens lay eggs. Eggs, right? You see that? That's that's the uh, that's the same dial. We're in the same dialect of English, right? Even though we're in the state of Illinois, and if you go to all Joliet, right? That's not that far. It's the um, it's a satellite city which has now been incorporated into the city of Chicago's metropolitan area. You'll hear people use the southern variant for cantaloupes, and they'll call it musk melon. And so it was through the musk melon. Yeah. Uh, so you see how. Ron, have you ever heard someone down in Georgia say musk melon? Admittedly, I've never really been in the market for musk melon <laughs> down here, so that may be part of the limiting factor. <laughs> oh, that's that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, yeah. But it's it's water that that connects us. It's water that was at the root of Chicago, and it's water once again that was at the beginnings of Buffalo as well, right? Uh, well, so Dan, that is a perfect. <laughs> I don't mean to interrupt, but that's a perfect segue because we alluded to this in part one. We've alluded to it in part two. You are running for political yeah. office, and you are you are such a um, humble guy that you're like, oh, I don't. We don't have to talk about that at all. We can just talk about you know all sorts of cool stuff. And I love yeah. doing that, but I do want to sure. talk about you know. I think Ron and I want to talk about your campaign. Thank you. Can can you talk? Can you talk sure. about? what you're running for, what you're mm -hmm. running on, and why is this so passionate? You know, why is this so important Thank you. to you? Uh, so I'm running for the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. What is water reclamation? Well, history buff Dan Pogoszelski can tell you that this particular office originally started the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal District, sewer district. It treats wastewater. It has two responsibilities. Number one, treating wastewater. Number two, managing stormwater. And so water is at the key of this, but I would argue it's also central to the fate of not just Chicago, but the entire Great Lakes region, the Rust Belt. We've seen the tough economic times that this part of the country has had, but there's a lot of promise in what people call the blue economy, that this is exactly what's going to change the fortunes of our area. So long as we make sure that we manage it correctly, um, if somebody loves, for example, uh, uh, a fine wine or, or a good beer, good brewski, which here in the Midwest, many are partial to, uh, or uh, a fine malort, you need good water. Cannot, you cannot yes. produce it without water. Um, you know, the word vodka, vodka, it means, you know, it's a diminutive for like little water. <laughs> um, and mm -hmm. you cannot... Yeah, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, Voda, Voda's water. This comes back. Well, I want to say, too, even like whiskey water of is life. like, it's like, yeah, water of life, yeah. Agua yeah. Vita Aquavita. or something. Some... Aqua Vita. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Vita, yeah, yeah. Well, that was Latin. So. <laughs> um, yeah. It's all water. Um, but it's it's at the root. I mean, when you talk about even we as human beings, we're mostly water, right? Our, our cells are literally mostly um, H2O. And so I would argue that this is the most important office that people aren't aware of. Because when you say MWRD, people, their eyes might glaze over. And it's not something that they are very familiar with. That's one of the reasons why I'm very passionate about it is because if we were looking at revitalizing our region, if we're looking at ensuring a prosperous future, we have to manage this most precious resource. Additionally, you have where um, the infrastructure to really piggyback on Chicago's history as a capital of innovation that I will spirit um 
the innovations that made it possible for us to live in Chicago, whether it is the, the, um, our legacy of the canal that Joliet and Marquette had written about on their travels back, that if someone were to build a canal here, they would be able to rule the North American continent. This government entity is the entity that reversed the flow of the Chicago River, that built the huge sanitary ship canal, but also built the very, um, Folks might not be familiar with it, but what's called the Deep Tunnel Project, which has intrigued interest all over the world, over 100 miles of tunnels, as big as underground rivers, where at parts, you could literally drive a semi-truck through it. And when it's completed in 2029, we started building it in 1975, we'll be able to hold over 17 and a half billion gallons right? That's a huge amount of water. However, right now we have ongoing f flooding right now happening in Australia, epic flooding. And whereas this, what's called gray infrastructure, gray, like the color of cement has done mm -hmm. wonders. Um, if we get one inch of rainwater all over Cook County at the same time, that's 15 billion gallons of water. So what happens when we get two inches of, mm. of rainfall? What about three? Serious flooding. Exactly. And so is that the purpose of, 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 of what you were talking about that's going to be built and completed by 2029? Is it supposed to help regulate? It's, it's supposed the, to. So the, think of it this way. If you were to see what the, what the Chicago River looked like, 300 years ago, you would see a waterway very different than what we see when we look in the loop and you see these crystal mountainsides surrounded by a very defined channel. As I say, wasn't it very that's swampy? Exactly. Well, yeah, wasn't, yeah, the vast majority. Yeah. That's why Chicago is so flat is because for many years when Glacial Lake Chicago, as scholars call it, first formed, this was the bottom of the lake. You can see whether on the south side, you call it Ridgeland, on the north side, You'll hear it called, referred to as Narragansett. And you see on that ridge, which is a subcontinental divide, and water, one drop will fall, and it originally went into the Chicago River before that river was reversed. That would end up in the Great Lakes, and then through the St. Lawrence would end up in the Atlantic Ocean. Another one would go into the Des Plaines River from where it would merge into the Illinois, then the Mississippi, and be down in New Orleans for Mardi Gras. <laughs> and this all happened it's yeah, pretty incredible this, to this, think about this, this right here and uh because of the fact that we're on this swampland whether it was in the spring or in the fall you had where the flatness caused that you could even connect between these two rivers these two uh watersheds without being able without having to get out of your own canoe back in the day. And so that's the, where the word portage, like the word por portage from portable comes from. Mm. People before, when they weren't so fortunate, would, would take this shortcut and they would carry their canoe to be able to basically traverse the North American continent. And so this is why mm. the idea is like, wow, well, if you had a canal, then you wouldn't need to be worried about um, having access to water. You could just literally go from waterway to waterway nonstop. And so, yeah. Well, so, so Dan, I want to, I want to talk about the, the MWRD more in, in terms of the role, because, you know, you're talking about several different things, which I find interesting. And my, I just want to clarify, is the organization doing all of them? Meaning is, is there an element where it's the sanitation component, but then it's also the, the, the safety to prevent flooding. Um, is, is it also involved with like, I know there's, been a lot of progress made with Chicago River in terms yeah. of its cleanliness and safety um, for wildlife. Like, is yeah. it all of this? Is it all fall under yeah. this organization? One hundred percent. And so, uh, in fact, the shed, uh, the shed aquarium. We all know the shed is a wonderful place to visit. But just like the Field Museum, it also has an amazing research component to it. And so, in partnership with this government body, uh, there was a study that was released recently which talked about how. Uh, 
the smaller the presence of uh, fecal bacteria in waterways, the more diversity of, of fish species that you'll actually be able to find in it. Um, and so <laughs> these are things which are linked. We also have where, and this is one of my passions of, of why I'm running for this office, is there, this is an office which on the one hand has some of the best specialists in the world. Um, their Twitter game is amazing. If, you, if you're someone who, like me, has a soft spot for historic photos, um, it's hard not to be awestruck by some of the projects that you'll see these uh, photos from times gone by over 100 years ago as people are blasting out limestone or digging out mud or constructing a bridge uh, in black and white. Nonetheless, this government entity, which has some of the best specialists and scientists in the world, one of the things that makes this uh, sewer district unique is that in many other cases, you have where uh, for projects, it's outsourced out. Not so with the MWRD. Uh, much of it's in-house, and there is an aptitude that comes out of people who've dedicated their lives to understanding the system that I would argue has been of benefit. And I want to make sure that we protect that, especially as people uh, in different parts of the country have uh, tried to privatize some of these things. I think that this is one of the integral parts that we need to protect and has been and needs to be an advantage um, for us with the MWRD well, and you talk about yeah. the blue economy, right? And that is certainly going to become sure. more and more important as but, the decades go on. But I think that we need so, a buy. But so, I think you know, that we also need to have buy-in. So many of these solutions, whether so, I talked about, for example, uh, I brought up gray infrastructure. So the infrastructure that the government, this government entity builds. But what's also necessary is buy-in from people talking to mayors. Uh, out in the suburbs, they'll tell you that when you go and ticket someone for having their downspout connected to the sewer and you go and you tell them disconnect it, they'll disconnect it while the inspector is there, but then they'll put it back in. Um, the word flushable baby wipe. There is no such thing as flushable wipes. This is something which is a huge cost. If you were to look at nationwide, I mean, this is like millions of dollars. This is, this is a huge problem. Uh, one should never use glitter. Glitter is essentially microplastics. And we're not even sure of all the horrible effects that this has. Um, and so... Back to your point about the uh, flushable wipes. For anybody, any of our listeners, uh, Google Fatberg, and you'll have a, somewhat of an appreciation for what many uh, sewage workers go through because of the disposable well, so, wipes. And, and especially the fatbergs, you have where grease, people will pour grease down and this accumulates and it's, it's, it's a horrible thing. But all of, these, all of this comes back to decisions that people make. And so um, one of the priorities that I want to address is communication and having an onus on reinvigorating the communication so that we can let people know and act in concert with them to make these changes. I talked about green infrastructure projects to work with other government entities to make it easier for people to do things like create community gardens, to be an advocate for uh, yeah. permeable pavers, for example, when there's a school district or a, a library district uh, that's doing an investment. Like, hey, can we look at putting in permeable pavers on a substantial part of your parking lot and work whether with people on the county level, the township level, or on the municipal level together to all chip in and to do that. And so the MWRD is doing some of that. And I think that's necessary. I think that we can do more. And that's why I'm running for it is to try to connect well, with a few people because whether it's been as the head of a chamber of commerce, whether it's been working as a union organizer, uh, whether it's been working in civic engagement for the treasurer, um, whether it's been working as a legislative aide, I want to 
be that connector uh, for folks with this government institution because it needs a higher profile. Well, and, and honestly, that's music to my ears, Dan, because I think, at least in my opinion, and I am an eternal optimist, I think so many people um, do things like like using glitter and like flo- flushing wipes down the toilet, not because they're they're mean spirited. It's 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 purely out of ignorance, right? And so there there is that level of communication and education that the general populace needs. I, I feel the same exact way about um, environmentalism as well. I think so many people recognize there's a problem but they don't even know where to get started. It's like, okay, I can recycle, but what else? And it's like, no, there's actually a lot of things you can do that are very small, but it, re- it requires the education. Exactly. So I, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's incredible what you're doing and, and what you're running on. My, my only yeah. question, cause I know we we're, <laughs> we're running out of time here, Dan, although we could talk yeah. to you all day is, can you talk very quickly, especially for people who are in the Chicago region, what is the relationship between MWRD and your city aldermen or your mm-hmm. state legislators or your county officials? What's, what's sure. the dynamics so there? Our responsibility for water is starts when you flush it down the toilet or when it comes down your sewer. And as I said, managing stormwater or treating effluent. And when flooding happens, when uh, something is wrong with the sewers, right? Um, now, granted, sewers are managed municipally, right? Um, but that water ends up in an intercepting sewer, which in turn is either goes to Stickney, goes to the North Side plant, which is now named for Terry O'Brien. Um, it comes to us. And so we work in partnership with these local elected officials. Um, I would like to have more resource fairs. So it's been something where you'll have a, co- a commissioner that comes out. I would like to try to scale that up. I would like to go out to schools. So why am I in the car right now? I was just at Vernard Ellsbury. So Vernard Ellsbury is the mayor of Hazelcrest. I had the opportunity to go down here and reconnect with folks from Bremen Township. And uh, as I was here for his event, I was actually spoken to, uh, I was actually connected to a person who's a local teacher. And he had told me about wanting to have me talk to his class. And I would love to do that. It's one of the reasons why I want this position is so that I can go out and try to connect with young folks, people that are impressionable, people for whom in it seems to me in this generation are very attuned to the turning point where we're at with regards to the environment and really feel motivated to make a change. And if I can help ignite, uh, give a little spark, that would be a great thing. Amazing. So listen, Dan, I know <laughs> we got to run. I, I wish we could talk more, but for for yeah. anyone listening, one, how can we find you? you? How can we get involved? So, uh, thank you. Um, in your campaign? So um, right now, uh, we're most active on Facebook. So Dan Pogoszelski for MWRD, D-A-N-P-O-G-O, R like rated R, Z like a zebra, E like everybody, L like love, S like Sam, K like a kite that you fly, I like an igloo, um, for MWRD. That's the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. And so uh, follow me there. Reach out to us. would love to connect with you. Um, would love to connect with more folks here in Cook County. Um, you know, cities in general are, Edward Glazer argued, the greatest invention that humans came up with. But there are problems that come up when people live on top of each other. One of those has always been disease. And just like I talked about innovations in Chicago, the innovations of the sewer district make it possible so that we humans can live in close proximity with each other without falling victim to pandemics of waterborne diseases that we did since time immemorial. You know, archaeologists recently who are going in ancient Roman toilets found parasites that were transmitted. And it didn't matter if someone was extremely wealthy, if someone was someone who was poor, uh, they all fell victim to these diseases. And because of the innovations that we came up with, 
some of them here in Chicago with treating sewage. Uh, thankfully, that is something which is in the past and something that as we ourselves are exiting a pandemic, uh, should remember. Right. Constant so, reminder. Yeah. I've got a quick sure. question for you, somewhat topical. Um, so it's by the time yeah. this episode is going to be released, it's oh. going to be St. Patty's Day. And something pretty the marvelous River, has happened to, right. you know, the Chicago we, we, River. We, yes. It's turned green. Vegetable dye. And I've heard that's th- the yeah, way that they do it. Dye. It's all safe, right? Yeah, it's a vegetable dye. That's awesome. And this once again gets... It looks... Oh, 100%. It looks great this and year, too. Once again, this comes back to an innovation that we came, we came up with in Chicago that now is famous, you know, all over the world. And so sometimes Chicago can be uh, a tough city to love. But we cannot give up our metropolitan area. Uh, we have done so many great things. And I believe that if we really apply ourselves, we can really harness that energy. And so long as we start caring for each other in a, a, in a, in a better fashion, um, we can really turn the corner. Beautifully said. I think there's nowhere to go from there except yeah. one last thing. Like Columbo. Uh, we're we're gonna one we're gonna link thing. to <laughs> right. We're gonna link to <laughs> the site you. you referenced earlier so people can follow you and keep track with you. But also for anyone yeah. in the Chicago area, when so, our uh, I'm elections running for the two year term for the Metropolitan Water Reclamation MWRD and the primary election um, will be the election where where um, this position really will be decided. And so on the Democratic ballot, uh, vote for Dan Pogoszewski for the two-year term for MWRD. I, I implore everyone, my slate mates, Mariana Spiropoulos, she is a former president, brings a wealth of knowledge and experience. Yumika Brown, she's a clerk in Madison who took a tragedy in her own life where her child nearly died from a waterborne disease and channeled that into a passion yeah. for water issues. Uh, she is also slated for the six-year term alongside Mariana. Teresa Flynn, who, thanks to her courage, she was a mother that really wasn't interested in either government or politics. And uh, when, unfortunately, there was a an environmental issue because they were poisoning locals where contaminated well water was being added in to the water they were pouring from the city of Chicago. And thanks to her involvement, she ran as the angry mom, won as the first trustee in Crestwood, then ended up as um, someone who had legislation change in Springfield. Um, these three powerful women are my slate mates, and it's an honor to, to be with them. And I would implore every one of your listeners to vote for them at the same time that they vote for me. <laughs> Yumika Brown, Mariana Sparopoulos, Terrific. And- Patricia, Teresa Flynn. For the for the Essex year terms, June the twenty eighth, and I'm running for the I'm for the two year term. So June the twenty eighth, two years of Deborah Shore's term, who's now the regional administrator for the EPA, thanks to her, her nomination by President Biden. Amazing. Well, Dan, this has been uh, an incredibly enlightening, very fascinating discussion. And uh, good luck with your campaign. Again, we will yes. link all of this information so all of you uh, listeners can can follow Dan along his journey. And uh, we'll we'll be seeing everyone soon. 